God, you have been so good to us. Lord, we welcome you into the service tonight, Lord, to fill us with your love, to fill us with your spirit, Jesus. Lord, through every song that is sung, through every word that's spoken, Lord, that it all be done to bring glory and honor to your name. Touch us, we pray today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap and a shout of praise? He is Can we worthy. stand pleased tonight for the reading of God's word? And if you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. I heard a pastor some time ago talk about what God wants to do with people in today's generation. And it makes no difference who you are or where you're at in life, where you've come from. It makes no difference if you're young or old. God has a plan and purpose for your life. Some of you may be teaching in Sunday school. Some of you may be singing in a choir. Some of you may be playing an instrument. Some of you uh, may be driving in a church van. Some may preach and some may work behind the scenes. But never tell yourself that you're too old to do anything for God. Well, I know a lot of times uh, when people grow older, uh, I know a lot of times people, all they want to do is just sleep around. Well, guess what? God's got a plan for you because his word says that our old men shall dream dreams. So while you're sleeping away and resting and enjoying your retirement, let God speak to you through the dreams when you're sleeping. Now, that has nothing to do with the message, but I just wanted to throw that in, give you something to think about. But tonight I want to talk to you on the subject of being empowered of the Holy Ghost 
for the last days. We need to be empowered by the Holy Ghost to fulfill our mission in these last days. And my prayer is that God would empower us and baptize us in the Holy Ghost that we may participate in this last day's harvest that God wants to do around this nation and around this world. One more time, can we lift our hands toward heaven and let's pray for his blessing upon this message. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that every promise in your word is true. Lord, that you have promised to return, that you are calling to gather your church. And, Lord, we thank you, Lord, and we pray, God, that you would have your way in this service through this message as we study your word, that our minds be alert, that our hearts be receptive as we receive from you the infallible, the inerrant, the ever-living seed of the word of God that we may leave here changed and renewed and empowered by your spirit in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. The final days for preparation at any event is always a time of increased urgent activity. I remember several years back when Alyssa and I first became engaged to get married. We knew that we needed to get to work. And sometimes I feel like I was working faster than she was. But uh, that's another story for another day. But uh, we began looking at houses, and our realtor told us that we looked at over 40 houses when I finally made an offer. And we found the house that was just right for us. And uh, we had met with many pastors, and getting a wedding date set was not the most easiest task because uh, we were working with uh, four pastors, and Brother Brankel being one of them. And you know Brother Brankel is a very busy evangelist at that time. And so we were trying to work with him and work with Alyssa pastors and then one of the pastors from our church but uh, we finally had the wedding date set and so when we get down to the final week of preparation the week of the wedding was perhaps the busiest and stressful I have ever been in my life and I know for Alyssa and for her mother and for everybody in our family we were really stressing out because it was Monday morning and we're not ready and we don't have everything set ready to go but I was in charge of setting up the tables and chairs and decorating the youth center for the rehearsal dinner. Alyssa and her mother oversaw the decorating of the fellowship hall and the sanctuary. And so the wedding was going to be on Saturday afternoon. And the night before the wedding was crunch time. We were making our final preparations. We were trying to get everything finished and set up. Uh, Alyssa and some of her bridesmaid and her mother was at the church till after 2 o'clock in the morning on Friday night trying to finish getting everything set up she had less than 12 hours to go home get a good night's rest to get up early enough to get her hair done for the most exciting day of her life at least I hope it was so it's the day of the wedding and I'm still trying to get everything finished at the house so the house is ready for somebody to come live in it because we'd had that house sitting there for a few years empty and the new smell had already ran out of it and so I'm trying to make sure the house is presentable so I can bring my wife to a, a, a house that looks brand new. And so I'm running behind, and I thought I was supposed to be at the church at 12 for pictures, and apparently I was running behind. So I'm on my way to the church, and I'm sitting in, in traffic. If you ever drive in Van Buren on Saturdays, you need to find something better to do. You cannot get from the north side of Van Buren to the south side of Van Buren. It's only three miles, but it takes 30 minutes to get there. And so I'm sitting in traffic, and I get involved in a traffic accident, a hit and run. They hit me and ran, and uh, I'm running late for the wedding. I called the police, filed the report, and they didn't want to do anything about it, so I said, just give me the report, and I'm going to the wedding. And so all I knew is my, my taillight still worked. That's enough to get me to Canada. So I'm on my way to the wedding. I'm running late, so we get there. Everything was crunch time. It was hectic the last few minutes trying to get ready. But the closer we were getting to that wedding, the more urgency we knew that we needed to hurry and get everything together so everything works out at the right time at the right place. And when you're looking at what the Word of God is talking about concerning the last days, the last days is a, a time of energy. Increase. It is a time of urgency in the spiritual realm. And so in this message tonight, we're going to be looking at some of the signs of the times of the last days that is spoken about in the Word of God and the timeline of when these events will be taking place. And we will also look at some of the things that have taken place already. In the church world today, there seems to be uh, many people who like to speculate uh, their idea of the order of events 
for the last days. There were others that liked to teach their opinions, and then there were different teachings of the order of events, especially concerning the timing of the rapture. There are some that believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation period. Others believe that the rapture will take place in the middle of the tribulation period. And then there are some that believe the rapture will take place after the tribulation period. So let me explain for just a moment. Some of you watching online may not understand what rapture is about. The word rapture is nowhere to be found in the word of God. But the meaning of the rapture is there. Rapture means to be caught up. It means to be caught away, to be with Jesus. It is the belief that the saints of God will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and taken to heaven to forever be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the scriptural foundation for the rapture is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17, the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and the Bible says that so shall we ever be with the Lord. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now there are those that believe that the rapture takes place after the tribulation. They get that idea from one verse of Scripture. But if they would read the verses that follow that particular text, they would receive the message much clearer and understand that their belief is in error. In Matthew chapter 29, excuse me, Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 through 31, the Bible says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, if we were to stop right here, this could be an indication that Jesus was not going to come until after the tribulation. But when you go back and look at what we saw in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 through 17, we see that it is a catching away with the dead in Christ rising first to meet the Lord and a catching away of all the living saints of God. They are caught away together and they are taking taken to heaven but when you look at Matthew chapter 24 verse 31 that after the tribulation we see Jesus Christ coming verse 31 says and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other I want to read this first again from the new living it says and he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of the trumpet and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven so when you look at verse 31 of Matthew chapter 24 this is not a picture of the rapture the rapture is described in 1 Thessalonians when the dead in Christ shall rise and then we who are alive and remain are caught up together and so shall we ever be with the Lord. But in Matthew chapter 24 verse 31, this is talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ which does not take place until after the tribulation period. So after the rapture of the church, the man of sin will be revealed called the Antichrist. He will sign a peace treaty with Israel and the nations of the Middle East, which will be establishing a, a period of peace, plan, planning for seven years. But this treaty will be broken after three and a half years through. And the Bible says that all hell literally is going to break loose on planet Earth. The wrath of God will be poured out. And at the end of that tribulation period, that is when verse 31 of Matthew chapter 24 takes place. Jesus comes back to this earth physically. He gathers together all of those who have become Christians during the tribulation period. And when he comes back to earth, the Bible says that he gathers his elect not only from the earth, but also from heaven. 
So if Jesus Christ is coming back to earth in this picture and he's bringing with him people from heaven, how did those people get into heaven if the rapture of the church does not take place until after the tribulation? So this is why I, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture because the word of God shows us very plainly that after the tribulation, Jesus Christ is returning back to earth. He is calling forth those who become Christians during the tribulation, but he's also gathering people with him to bring with him from heaven. So this is why I believe the rapture will take place before the tribulation. God's word says that it will. So based on our text this evening, we're going to address and answer three questions about what's going to take place in the last days. So first of all, the first question I want to ask, what is meant by the phrase, the last days? We hear a lot of talk today about, oh, we're living in the last days. We see the signs of the last days around us. But, but do we really understand what we're talking about when we're speaking of the last days? If you look back at the ancient teachings of the Jewish people, they recognized the last days speaking about a time of messianic blessing. In other words, they are talking about a time in which God is going to bring judgment upon the ungodly people of the world. Ever since mankind sinned against God in the Garden of Eden, sin has spread all across this world. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Sin is costly and sin is deadly. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you have prayed to God to forgive you of your sins, and if you have believed in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, accepting the price that he paid on the cross, the Bible tells us that you will be saved from the eternal punishment of sin. However, the people that do not come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior, those are the people that will face the judgment of God in the very end. So this is something that the Jewish people stressed in their teaching. They look forward to the day in which the Messiah would come to this world and rid the world once and for all of sin. Jesus Christ the Messiah came 2,000 years ago, but we see that sin is still here. It is not until Jesus comes back to earth the second time and we get into the new heavens and the new earth that sin will be destroyed forever. In the book of Jude, which only has one chapter in Jude, verse 14 through 15, it describes the Jewish teaching of the final judgment. The Bible says, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Now, I find this to be one of the most interesting passages of Scripture in all of the Word of God because Jude is quoting the writings of Enoch. And nowhere in our copy of the Word of God in the Old Testament or the New Testament will you find the passage of Scripture that Jude is quoting. I've tried to search it. Has anyone else tried to search it? You're not going to find in our copy of the Word of God what Jude is quoting. But there is a book, we call it one of the books of the Apocrypha, it is called the Book of Enoch. We do not have that book in our canon of Scripture, and I'm going to tell you the reason why we do not have that book. The reason we do not have the Book of Enoch in our canon of Scripture is because that after the Book of Enoch was in circulation sometime before and during the life of Jesus Christ, this book was lost for over a thousand years. And the King James Bible was published in the year 1611. And then we go to Ethiopia. In a Jewish synagogue in Ethiopia in the 1700s, the book of Enoch, along with several other copies of Old Testament books, were found. So how do we know if these books are accurate? 
1947, another finding of Old Testament books as well as the book of Enoch was found in the caves of Qumran near the region of the Dead Sea. Amazingly, when they tested these scriptures, they matched word for word according to everything else that's been found in ancient manuscripts, and they checked it along with what we have in the word of God that circulates around the world today. Everything that was recorded matched word for word, and I have even looked at the book of Enoch myself, and those words that were written in the book of Jude match what was written in the book of Enoch word for word, so that lets us know that thousands of years ago, these Jewish scribes were, were working diligently diligently to be sure that the message of the coming of the Messiah was never to be lost from humanity. So when we're looking at the subject of the last days, we're talking about a time period of messianic blessing. The second coming of, or the, the second meaning of the last days is also talking about a vindication to God's people. In other words, you could say that the last days begins the church age. So on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter said that the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was a fulfillment of prophecy concerning the last days. So for nearly 2,000 years, the gospel message of Jesus Christ has been preached around this world for one purpose, so that the entire world will hear the gospel message and have an opportunity to repent before Jesus comes back to earth again. In the New Testament, we have a revelation of the last days. Peter identifies the last days as a time of pouring out of God's Spirit upon mankind. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, Peter was preaching. He says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. These last days includes the church age. It began with the first coming of Jesus Christ as he came to this world in the power of the Holy Ghost. And then we have the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. And this age extends until the second return of Jesus Christ. Even after the rapture of the church, there will be people that will be saved. They will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which lets us know that the Holy Spirit will still be present on this earth, even during the tribulation. However, the restraining power of the Holy Spirit will be removed. That will allow the Antichrist to come to power. So we are living in essence of the last days. We are a last days people. This is the church age. This is the time frame of the dispensation of the Holy Ghost. That means we are living between the times. We're living between the first coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago and the second coming of Jesus which could be very very soon. So with that being the case. Uh, this is the time for the church to proclaim the gospel message uh, like never before. This is the hour for souls to be saved. Uh, this is the hour for revival. Church, our time is just about up uh, and what we do for the kingdom of God, uh, we must do quickly uh, while we still have time for he is coming very soon. I will go over in more detail in just a moment of how close I believe we are to the rapture of the church. But we need to live our life in a sense of expectation and urgency. We see the last eyewitness account of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 10 through 11. The Bible says, While they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So the last days are the days in which the Bible prophecy will be coming to pass at a noticeable rate and which will usher in the second coming of Jesus Christ. So what are the biblical signs of the last days? The last days will be a time of finishing up a time of finalizing God's plan for the nations of this world. If we truly believe that we are living in the last days, then there is an urgency, a message of urgency that needs to be preached around this world. 
This message is in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. The Bible says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. As we look forward to the soon return of Jesus Christ at the rapture of the church, I want us to understand that the perilous times that we see taking place around this world, the wars, the natural disasters, and so forth, these are not necessarily the sign that the rapture of the church is about to take place. But the closer that we get to this to the rapture of the church, uh, the more frequent these things are going to be taking place. But there are specific prophecies given to us in the Word of God concerning the time leading up to the rapture of the church. It all revolves around one small nation in the Middle East. All Bible prophecy concerning the end times revolves around the nation of Israel. Over 2,500 years ago, there were prophecies given about the nation of Israel during a time when Israel did not exist. It literally did not exist at that time. The nation had gone through wars. The nation had split. There was a northern kingdom called Israel. Their capital city was Samaria. There was a southern kingdom called Judah with its capital city in Jerusalem. And soon that land was conquered by the Babylonian Empire. Later, it was captured by the Persians. Eventually, it became part of the Roman Empire. And years later, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, taking on the name of Palestine. But it was told 2,500 years ago that the Jewish people would be gathered back to the land of Israel and that Israel would become a nation. And these are things that the Bible says would take place in the last days. Also, it was prophesied that Israel would have a national flag that would represent the Jewish people and that Jerusalem would become the capital city of Israel. All of this would take place in the last days. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 through 12, and it shall come to pass in that day, speaking of the last days, that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. This is speaking of the Jews, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. This is all talking about a regathering of the Jewish people from all the nations of the world, including island nations. The Jewish people had been scattered literally all over this world. And the Bible tells us that God himself is going to regather these people back to the land of Israel. They would become a nation. And we get that clue in the next verse. It says, he shall set up an ensign. An ensign is an old uh, English word for a banner, which is a flag. It is the, the nation's banner. It is a flag. It's a flag for the nations and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So here's what is going to take place. The Bible tells us that the Jewish people will be regathered to the land of Israel. Israel will be reestablished as a nation. Israel will have a flag that represents the Jewish people. And Jerusalem will be the capital city. Now we find out about Jerusalem and uh, the prophecies concerning Jesus when Jesus was born. The prophet Zechariah, uh, John the Baptist's father said in Luke chapter 1 verse 32, it says, He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. The, the prophecies of, of Zechariah and, and when the angel came to visit Mary, this is what was talked about when Jesus was going to be born. That Jesus was going to sit on the throne of David. That would mean that Jerusalem would have to be the capital city of Israel. So these are things that would be taking place in the last days. So when do we know that the last days began? 
On the day of Pentecost, there is a reference to the last days, but this is referring to the times of refreshing. In other words, it is a time for the church to prepare themselves for when the last days begins, leading up to the time of the rapture. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus was approached by his disciples on the Mount of Olives, and they were asking him some questions concerning the time frame of the last days. When are these things going to take place? And what is going to be the significant event in the world that tells us that the end is near? Matthew 24, verse 3 through 6, the Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So these are three questions that were being asked by the disciples. When shall these things be? This is talking about the time of the rapture. What is the sign of your coming? In other words, what are we supposed to be looking for to know that your coming is near? The third question, what is the sign of the end? What is the ultimate event that is going to take place that we can know that it's just about over? Verse 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Over the years, there have been a lot of people that have tried to set dates for when they thought the rapture of the church would take place. Others have claimed to have some divine message from God, only to lead people astray. Verse 6 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Think about this for just a second. Ever since Cain slew his brother Abel, there have been perilous times. There have always been somebody killing somebody else. There have always been natural disasters almost on a daily basis. Somewhere around the world today, there is a nation at war with another nation for whatever reason. These are things that's been taking place for thousands of years. So what does Jesus say about all of this? He says, see that you be not troubled. In other words, don't worry about that. You're going to have these problems. You're going to have wars. You're going to have disasters. You're going to have all of this taking place around the world. He said, the end is not yet. See that you be not troubled. The end is not yet, for all these things must come to pass. See, next he starts to give us something very specific to look for. Now, remember I told you earlier about some specific prophecies concerning the nation of Israel that's going to take place in the last days, uh, such as the Jewish people being regathered, that Israel would become a nation, that they're going to have a flag representing the Jewish people, and Jerusalem will be the capital city. So when does all of this begin? What is the sign that the coming of Jesus Christ is near? In Matthew chapter 24, verse 7 and 8, this is when he gives us specific things to look for in our world verse 7 for nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places all these are the beginning of sorrows so what we gather from this passage is that this is the beginning of the end with specific things that are going to take place that we can look for So first of all, he says, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So we have multiple nations and multiple kingdoms that are rising against each other at the same time. Never before in the history of the world have there been a time when multiple nations of the world went to war at the same time with each other until the beginning of World War I. In World War I. World War I was from July 28th, 1914, until November 11th, 1948. Ironically, November 11th is now the day that we celebrate veterans. We call it Veterans Day. But this war, World War I, was very significant in that since the beginning of that war taking place, the prophetic timeline for the end times concerning the nation of Israel, I believe, began ticking, so to speak. So we have things to look for, starting in Matthew 24, verse 7 and 8. He's talking about nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. This is World War I, I believe. 
But when you also look at what else was taking place around the world during the same time period, this is also when God started to bring to pass prophecies concerning the Jewish people and Israel. Israel did not exist as a nation. There was no such geographical location in this world called Israel. But during World War I, in 1917, the Balfour Declaration was a public statement issued by the British government during the First World War announcing its support for the establishment of a national home to the Jewish people in Palestine, which was present-day Israel. At that time, it was part of the Ottoman Empire with a small minority Jewish population. After this world war, the next prophecy event in Matthew 24, the Bible talks about famines. I did a little research on this. Time magazine reports that as World War I came to an end in 1918, that the world was not in the clear. Farms that were in Europe and Russia were completely destroyed in the war, causing a major food supply shortage. In 1920, droughts swept across Soviet Russia, leading to even more failed harvest, and then famines began in the summer of 1921. Over 5 million people perished due to starvation in the next year. 5 million people dying of starvation right after World War I. Also, it was during the same time that a great pandemic swept across the world. The Bible speaks of pestilence. Pestilence is an incurable disease. Look up in the thesaurus, and pestilence also talks about, it's a meaning of a pandemic. In 1918, influenza was responsible for the death of 50 million people around this world. 50 million people. The most deadliest disease ever to strike humanity on planet Earth. One-fifth of the world's population was attacked by this deadliest, deadliest virus ever recorded. In Jesus' last message to the disciples on the Mount of Olives in Matthew chapter 24, in verse 9, he's referring to the Jewish people. He's very specific here. And it's in the same time frame that this is going to take place. He says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So what do you think the next big event was that took place in world history? Between the year 1941 and 1945, Nazi Germany and their allies murdered over 6 million Jews. This was one-third of the Jewish population in the continent of Europe. It was also during the same time frame between the years 1939 and 1945 that the Second World War broke out. So when the First World War took place, we began to see the prophetic timeline kick into action. The Second World War takes place. Nation rises against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It ushered in some more great events in the prophetic timeline. On May 14, 1948, a man by the name of David Ben-Gurion, he was the head of the Jewish agency, proclaimed the establishment of the state of Israel, and Israel became a nation. Within a few months, the Israeli flag was unveiled, depicting the star of David as a symbol to the Jewish people. Then we fast forward nearly 20 years later. In 1967, following the Six-Day War, Jerusalem was established as the capital city of Israel. And on May 14th, 2018, this is exactly 70 years to the date of Israel becoming a nation. President Donald Trump officially recognized Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel to the world by relocating our United States Embassy from the city of Tel Aviv to the city of Jerusalem. Everything that Jesus said was going to take place is coming to pass, and it's taking place in the exact same order that the Word of God said it was going to happen. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Church, if there was ever a time that today people are becoming offended over petty little things, it's taking place before our very eyes. History is being revised, so history will no longer be offensive. I was uh, hearing today about uh, Pastor 
Robert Jeffers, the First Baptist Church in Dallas, uh, he was uh, m making reference to what the libraries in their region are promoting in their libraries, books about the homosexual lifestyle, storybooks for children, uh, about a, a young child that has two mothers, uh, about other kids that have two fathers. Uh, that is scientifically impossible. Uh, and, and, and today, uh, pastors are being ridiculed and pastors uh, are being taken to court uh, for preaching what is in the word of God church we need to make sure that we are ready uh, Jesus Christ is coming soon uh, and we must know what we believe uh, and we must stand on the truth of God's word uh, if it costs us our tax exemption so be it uh, if they want to throw us in jail so be it the apostle Paul still preached uh, he still reached people even from a jail cell church we must get on board the old God gospel ship he's about to call us home and we're going home forever to be with the Lord Jesus Christ the utmost sign that Jesus gave to us that the rapture was about to take place I know it talks about earthquakes in diverse places I'm going to save that for another day but all of us know what's been taking place in our world. We have earthquakes taking place faster today than they've ever taken before. We have uh, geologists that tell us that one of the greatest earthquakes that will ever hit the United States will affect the whole Midwest region as a result of the New Madrid fault line located in the, uh, the, the boot hill of the state of Missouri. Sometimes we feel earthquakes in Oklahoma. Sometimes we feel earthquakes in Arkansas. But they're happening more frequently and more intense around the world. But the utmost sign that Jesus gives us that the rapture of the church was about to take place is in the statement given by himself in Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Why are we pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars a year into missions around this world? Why are we building churches in other nations? Why are we building Bible colleges? Why are we establishing Christian television nations? Why are we broadcasting services on the internet? Why? It's because we're doing our part to help that very last person hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. For his word says, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world uh, as a witness to all nations and what's the next big event he says then shall the end come church that's how close we are to the soon return of Jesus Christ Israel has become a nation the Jews have been regathered Israel has a capital city named Jerusalem recognized around this world they have a flag representing the Jewish people everything is taking place just as the word of God said church when we see these things happen it's time to lift up our head and rejoice for our redemption is drawing nigh Jesus Christ is coming very soon in the last days not only will there be things taking place around the world but in the church there is going to be a worldwide outpouring of the Holy Ghost on all of humanity in Acts chapter 2 verse 17 through 18 the Bible says and it shall come to pass in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So what are some of the implications of these truths on us today as Pentecostal people? We need to understand that we have been called by Jesus Christ and we have been empowered by the Holy Ghost to participate in this last day's harvest. It is God's plan for the nations. There is an urgency for us to tell people about Jesus. In John chapter 9 verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. We have been sent by God. We are working for him. And what we do for him, we must do very quickly before the opportunity of ministry is gone forever. 
We must each be personally empowered of the Holy Spirit to carry out the ministry that God has called us to do. In Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. In Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 5, being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me for John truly baptized in water but ye shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost not many days since so how can we participate in this last days mission that God has called us to participate in the first thing we need to understand is that we are a chosen vessel of God Almighty he has called every single one of us to go into this world and to proclaim the gospel message and we don't have to do it by ourselves. He wants to go with us. He wants to speak through us. He wants to work through us. He wants to minister through us. And the only way that can take place is that we must be filled with the Holy Ghost. So what must we do to be filled with His Spirit? The Bible says that we need to ask in prayer by faith to be filled with the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter 11, verse 9 through 10, Jesus says, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Verse 13 says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? We receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost by faith. In Mark chapter 11, verse Verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And then last, we need to speak by faith. As we begin to pray, as we begin to seek the face of God, and we call upon Him to fill us with the power of the Holy Ghost, then begin to speak in faith. Speak the word of God. Pray the name of Jesus. Pray the word of God and say, God, you said in your word that if I ask for the Holy Ghost, uh, I will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and proclaim the word of God in your prayer. And as you begin to praise God, God is going to begin to speak through you. The power of the Holy Spirit will begin to transform your speech. Uh, and the Bible says in Acts 2.4 that they were all filled uh, with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues uh, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, I believe that in these last days, Jesus Christ wants to empower his church one more time with the Holy Ghost to be a soul winner and to be a disciple maker who makes disciple makers, who makes disciple makers. And we must continue working for his glory, for his honor, for his credit, and in obedience to his word until he comes again. And when Jesus Christ comes, I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant can we stand together and give him praise he is coming very soon he is coming very soon every knee will bow every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I encourage you right now, find a place around these altars. Lift up your head toward heaven and thank him for that promise that he is coming very soon. What a day that's going to be when we see Jesus Christ. Oh, what a day that will be. Oh, when that Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face. The one who saved me by his grace When he takes me by the hand And he leads me through the promised land Oh, what a day, what a glorious day that will be
see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. I will meet you there. I will meet you there. We are going to see the King. I will meet you there. We are going to see the King. that you've gone to prepare a place for us that where you are we shall be also lord we thank you jesus father i pray that you go with us now lord that you lead guide and direct lord that you would bless and keep us lord that your face would shine upon each one father that you would be gracious to us father we pray for the peace of god that passes all understanding and we give you praise in jesus name amen and amen can you one more time give the lord a hand clap and a shout of praise Thank you. 